Welcome to Entanglement Radio on the Conversations from the Brink Network. I am your host, Angela Levesque, and this show is all about the potential and possibilities of what it means to be human. Our guest today is author and Reverend Dr. Karen Tate, and we're going to be exploring the role of the divine feminine, the sacred feminine, especially what it looks like um, for uh, a resurgence of uh, goddess spirituality. And I think that this is a very poignant topic for right now. Uh, Coming up next week, we do have um, Cynthia M. Ruiz on the program, and we're going to be talking about leadership in indigenous wisdom. So it'll be a fantastic show to follow up this one. If you'd like to know more about the show, you can go to the conversationsfromthebrink.com website. If you'd like to know more about myself, Angela Levesque, you can go to angelalevesque.com and you can find me on Facebook and on Twitter at Hestia Health. Um, So we are going to go right into it. Let me introduce my guest. Reverend Dr. Karen Tate is an author, teacher, speaker, radio show host, and social justice activist. Named one of the 13 most influential women in goddess spirituality, Karen hosts a long-running blog talk radio show called Voices of the Sacred Feminine. She appears in the influential and award-winning film, Femme, Women, Healing in the World. Uh, She is regularly interviewed in the media and also gives inspirational talks talks on topics that motivate, uh, uplift, and encourage equality, human rights, and social justice activism. Karen has written several books on the topic of the sacred feminine with titles like Goddess Calling, Inspirational Messages, and Meditations of of Sacred Feminine Liberation Theology, and Walking an Ancient Path, Rebirthing Goddess on Planet Earth, among many others. So with that, I feel very honored and blessed to welcome uh, Reverend Dr. Karen Tate to the program. Hi, Karen. How are you doing? Hi, Angela. Thank you so much for having me with you and your listeners today. Well, uh, as I said just briefly at the top of the show, this is a, a really poignant conversation, I think, as we head into, um, by the time this show comes out, it'll be a couple of weeks before the inauguration of President Trump, if you can believe that we're putting those two words together. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I so, know. Well, let's start there. So um I have been trying really hard not to be discouraged. And as more of the cabinet picks are coming out and you're just seeing that it's really shaping up to be a cabinet of the top one percenters. In fact, this will be the most wealthy cabinet in the history of our, of our government. Um, if everyone gets, ends up being, um, accepted, but what, how can you explain what's going on at this time? Well, um, I think patriarchy is in its death throes. And I know you've probably heard people say that before, but and I've heard it as well, but I believe it now more than ever. Uh, I think what we are seeing uh, was uh, is a necessary thing for us, quite frankly. I think uh, way too many people were too comfortable uh, in spite of the suffering out there. Um, I think there were a lot of incrementalists that just thought we could wait another, you know, 10, 15 years for change and everything would be fine. But, you know, other people were, uh, you know, had had been holding on by their fingernails for a really long time. And um, I, I think we got Trump because people don't feel the establishment cared about them. You know, the establishment was just answering to the 1%. And I think what they they erroneously thought Trump was going to be different. Now, I don't think Trump is going to be different, but I do think, now sit down, <laughs> I do think he is going to be a gift. Yes, I said a gift, and I'll tell you why. People are paying attention. People didn't just go back to business as usual. People are activated. People are motivated. I am sorry that it has to be, fear has to be the motivator. But you know what? People are organizing now. People are ready to stand up and get off the couch and do something. And I think that is an incredible thing. I think the Republicans uh, are going to overreach 
shoot themselves in the foot and that will be the end of them. And I think it, it, you know, everything will be in place to create that new paradigm that we have all been wishing for, desiring, hoping for, you know, the new normal where, um, you know, it's not survival of the fittest anymore. It's not predator capitalism anymore where, um, you know, it, there's more of a level playing field out there. And I think this is just the last hurdles we're going to have to go through to awaken people, to motivate people. And uh, I, I'm actually I'm actually kind of excited about this. Hmm. I, uh, I absolutely have thought of everything that you just talked about, that he's going to be a great uh, catalyst for change. And then I'm trying really hard not to go into that fear place. You know, I just saw that he... Uh, so many of the people that he's put in his cabinet, cabinets have been um, outspoken critics and thinking that those cabinets need to be, or those departments need to be destroyed. So, you know, he's putting people in charge of perhaps eliminating them. And maybe, I, I don't know, maybe that's where we need to go. But I, uh, I, I really, um, I really hope that what you're saying is true. And I do, I think I kind of waffle between, yeah, that's that's what's happening. And oh, crap. <laughs> well, you know, two things, two things. You know, I, I, I hear you and I, I go there, too. OK, um, but I am I am really trying hard to t- uh, for myself and to tell all my friends, you know what, let's create our re- own reality bubble. OK, because we know that what we put out in the world manifests. All right. So let's um, tune out the fear mongering media. Let's focus on what we want to create. Let's not, uh, I mean, let's, you know, let's use the fear in a positive way to keep us motivated. But I think all of these people that he is putting on the cabinet, uh, in his cabinet, that want to do these terrible things, they are going to hear the voice of the people. Look at how people rallied around Standing Rock, mm-hmm. Okay. Um, And I don't know if people remember, because a lot of people weren't paying that close of attention, but when George Bush started making noises about trying to privatize Social Security, people shut down the switchboard in Congress, and he quickly dropped that idea. So I think if we all stay awake and we all respond when some, excuse me, some shit comes down the pike— like they did when they were talking about privatizing Social Security, we have to stand up like Bernie Sanders talked about. This is the revolution we have been waiting for. And I think rather than just having uh, a a small percentage of the people who are ready, I think a lot of us are ready now. You know, we don't want what he's offering. We don't want what his cabinet is going to be offering. And and the people are going to have to stand together and let their will and their voices be heard. And there's all sorts of ways we can do it. You know, um, I, I was inspired by what Bernie Sanders was able to accomplish, the response to him. The media is actually treating him with respect now. He's all over media now. This message is resonating. And, um, you know, I think two years from now, things are going to look very different. When we go into the 2018 elections, I think there's going to be a course correction. Uh, I Yes, I absolutely agree. So I want to talk, I, I read this really powerful article the other day, and it said, I'm with her. And of course, that was kind of the hashtag that was started about Hillary, but it was actually the article was about um Kali, who is, you know, one of the, the dark goddesses of death, destruction, and rebirth. And so they were talking about uh, that this is really a time about, this is the age of the dark goddess. And I just thought it was interesting, because when you first read the title, you're thinking, I'm with her. And I would actually like your opinion on this, that I thought Hillary didn't really um, adequate, adequately represent <laughs> the sacred feminine, in, in my opinion. So there's kind of two things I want to talk about. First, what does this age of the dark dark goddess, what does that mean and what does that look like? And then also your thoughts on Hillary as, because people thinking, you know, when they think about divine feminine, they think about, you know, that that, that represents a woman and that she could have been our first woman president. But to me, she didn't embody a lot of the stuff we're talking about today. So I'll leave you with those two things. 
Uh, well, I totally agree with you, and thank you for these questions. Um, the dark goddess. You know, the dark goddess is also about destruction. You know, the dark goddess is about getting away, get, doing away with the things that no longer serve us so that something else can be reborn. And I think that's how we have to look at it. You know, Kali and Durga uh, were incredible, you know, uh, goddesses for fighting evil. And I think the evil that the, that the dark goddess fights is this domination, this exploitation, this predator capitalism, you know, uh, this austerity that so many governments have forced upon their people, this imbalance, income inequality, you know, CEOs making 500 times more than their workers who maybe don't even make enough money after working a 40-hour week uh, to have food, and they have to go get food with food stamps. This is a crime. This is immoral. And I think the dark goddess comes out and, and fights for justice. You know, she is a warrior goddess, and she is going to kill off the evil, the injustice that plagues humanity. And that's how I look at the dark goddess. And I embrace her fully, you know, and say, please bring it on, mother. Bring it on, because we need to have balance restored to the earth because you know what there is enough for all of us it just has to be distributed fairly and uh, this imbalance we've all been living through you know we we've had things stolen from us slowly slowly trickle by trickle drip by drip uh for decades now to the point where people don't even know that in the 70s and 80s you could get a job and you would have health care and you could uh, you know go to college for fifty dollars a semester you know people think that's that's unimaginable that we could have those things well you know we used to really have these things they were just taken away from us slowly slowly over time and I lay a lot of that blame at the foot of the Democrats who went corporatist like Hillary uh, rather than continue to stand behind the, you know, uh, the every man, the worker, and that's why Hillary lost, which I think brings us to the next part of your question. No, I don't think Hillary, even though she was a woman, I don't think she represented the sacred feminine. And, um, I, and I think that what's important to understand is, you know, a woman doesn't always embody the values of the sacred feminine. Oftentimes, she has benefited from the patriarchy, uh, and so she becomes, um, you know, uh, a, a tool of the patriarchy. And that's how I honestly saw Hillary. You know, she was, I mean, Hil I mean, Bernie said it, you know, do you think all of these corporations gave her all of that money for nothing? Do you think those transcripts she wouldn't release, that, that there was a reason she didn't release those transcripts? So just like when we talk about the sacred feminine, um, you know, it's important for men to understand this isn't about women taking over. Uh, this isn't about m women subjugating men uh, and making them second class citizens. This is a new, uh, well, it isn't a new, it's a revival of, of egalitarian ideas, of ideas of fairness, uh, partnership, nurturing, caring, sharing, level playing fields, you know, respect, justice, equality. And I honestly do believe that Bernie Sanders was the one who was really walking the talk of the sacred feminine. And I know I got in trouble with some of my women friends, you know, who said, well, why aren't you supporting the woman? Well, you know, the woman isn't always the right one. Look at Margaret Thatcher. Look at Sarah Palin, for instance. You know, there have been a lot of women in history who have just been, uh, you know, have propped up the status quo, the establishment, because they benefit from it. And, um, you know, I, I totally agree with you that she, I would love to see a woman in the White House, but she was not the right woman. And I think people sensed that um, and uh, they didn't want what she was selling because it was going to be more of the same. So then from that, I can take that we can't use the word feminism and, and sacred feminine interchangeably. There is a difference. I think that there's probably places where they connect, but feminine and feminism in and of itself doesn't necessarily um, fall within those some of those characteristics you were talking about. Is that true? 
Well, um, yes, and that's a very astute observation. Fem- okay, feminism, there, I guess you could maybe we could say there are different brands of feminism. You know, feminism originally meant that we wanted uh, we wanted justice, we wanted equality, we wanted human rights, um, you know, uh, and, and that sort of thing. And, and I can see that Hillary would want those sorts of things. However, it's in how you get to it. You know, I see Hillary was a corporatist feminist, okay? And, and in a way, that's an oxymoron. You know, there's a cognitive disconnect there because, you know, the corporate domination that people are suffering from right now in our history where, you know, uh, you know, you know, workers are being exploited across the globe. You know, corporatism is what's, I think, destroying the fabric of society in, in some cases, whether it be Mother Earth or whether it be, uh, you know, people who can't make enough money after they've worked a 40-hour week or they have no benefits or they've lost their retirement or they never had retirement. And, you know, they, uh, you know, you have people who don't want minimum wage. You have people that don't want overtime. You have people that think there shouldn't be laws to protect, um, you know, child labor. I mean, it's insane when you think about um, how corporations want to go unfettered with no regulation so that they can just make slaves of us all. And, you know, I, I, I think if you're talking corporate feminism, you have to be very careful and you have to really look closely at what that means because it can mean just more domination doled out by a woman instead of by, you know, the, the men who are usually sitting in the boardrooms. Where I think p- feminism you know, uh, in, in its original idea, in its purest sense, is sacred feminine ideals about, you know, we're all in this together. Let's take care of one another. You know, the, the partnership idea where we create win-win situations, like over in the Scandinavian countries, you know, they have something called the 40 percent solution. After, gov- you know, after government has paid for you to have a college education, they want to return on their investment. They require that boardrooms in some of these Scandinavian countries um, have 40% women in the boardroom, you know? So it's that sort of, you know, shift, bringing balance back, you know, that we can do, um, you know, it, 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 they can work together, but we have to be really careful. And I think women like Hillary with her corporate feminism, it's almost, I think, a faux feminism, if you will. Yeah, I absolutely, (laughs) I agree with you. So uh, you're speaking today in part, you're kind of doing a, a, a book tour for Goddess 2.0, and this idea of 2.0 means that this is a kind of a revisioning or a, a reimagining of goddess spirituality. And one of the things, in, and it's an anthology, and there's many wonderful um, essays written by both men and women. There was quite a few men as well. But in your chapter, you talk about the reawakening of our earliest sacred stories, and that those are really important. And would tell us, give us an example of maybe revisiting some of those sacred stories and, and why it's so important. Okay. Well, you know, what I think a lot of people don't realize is mythology shapes our culture. And if we grow up with a mythology where we only have a male God, we end up with male leadership. We end up with patriarchy. We end up with women subservient to men, uh, second-class citizens, men thinking they can still tell women what they can do with their bodies, with, you know, um, you know, uh, dictating women's morality, their pay, you know, 70 cents on the dollar, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, if we instead went back to our pre-patriarchal myths, if we went back to our egalitarian myths, or if we started rewriting new myths that had a healthier sort of attitude, then that then slowly shapes culture. And if you think that mythology is just, uh, you know, something you read when you were in eighth grade and it had no relevance, I would just say, think of the story of Pandora, where the woman opens up the box and, you know, gives us all the evils of the world or the ills of the world or the Garden of Eden. Look at the influence that story has had on women for thousands of years and still does today. 
You know, women is the sinner. Women is the temptress. You know, women have to suffer for uh, causing humanity to be bumped out of the Garden of Eden, all of this stuff. Well, uh, Merlin Stone, feminist foremother, real feminist, I uh, believe that that was one of the first pieces of political propaganda. It took us away from the ideals of the sacred feminine, from egalitarianism, where the genders were more equal, uh, and we had a feminine face of God along with a masculine face of God, and it shifted us into this patriarchal culture that we get from these Abrahamic religions. So let's just take uh, Demeter and Persephone, for instance. The, most people know the Demeter and Persephone myth where Hades abducts Persephone, takes her down into the underworld, and you know we have the seasons because Demeter is sad when her daughter is not with her up on earth anymore. Okay, that is the patriarchal version of Demeter and Persephone. And we believe that that story of abduction, rape, um, you know, taking the woman against her will, kidnapping, that in a way, this is just gives license for males to do bad things, uh, to dominate, okay, to exploit, to have their way, their, you know, you know, their will is the only thing that matters. There was an egalitarian version of Demeter and Persephone when it wasn't about abduction and rape and kidnapping. And there was a pre-patriarchal version where Hades wasn't even in the story. It was a story about a mother and a daughter and a good relationship between mother and daughter, where the mother learns that she has to let the daughter go off and live her life, <clears throat> and the daughter understands that she has to grow up and become a woman and choose her path. Now, when I teach that story, that myth now, I extrapolate on that. And I say, you know what, let's take it a step further. It's not just about mother and daughter relationships. It is about relationships between women, because women have to heal their relationships with one another, too. You know, because we've been hurt by patriarchy, there's too much um, uh, backstabbing and competition and ugliness between women, like when Phyllis Chesler wrote her wonderful book, Woman's Inhumanity to Woman. So now when I teach Demeter and Persephone, I also say this is about good relationships between women. That You know, we are all mothers or daughters, and, you know, this is about supporting one another, not being in competition with one another and doing all these insidious things that women tend to do when, you know, we're on the outs with each other. And, you know, there I said it, the elephant in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that is, uh, I think, and you see that a lot in social media, you see a lot of body shaming and just shaming in general. And you're right. I think that that, uh, those relationships between women are so important. And yet we, we don't know how to navigate them in our society that praises, you know, power over, that praises, um, you know, domination and competition. And it's, it's difficult to, uh, well, it can be difficult to navigate some of that. And, but I have seen such a resurgence. In fact, even just in my life in the past six months, I've um, started to become part of several women's groups. Some are very, uh, one is actually just based in connecting with the, the divine feminine. And another one is again, just nurturing our relationships in any way we can possibly, you know, professionally, personally. And it is, uh, it is changing my life. In fact, to have that, um, support, positive support network in my life in all aspects of, you know, be, as being a mother, as being a professional. And yeah, it's, it's really, uh, been supporting so many decisions and just the way that I show up. So it's yeah. been fantastic. Well, and, and, you know, it does make an incredible difference. You know, there was a time when I was afraid of my own voice. You know, I wouldn't even utter a word in public and look at me now, you know, <laughs> and, and, and I credit that to women who have supported me, who have nurtured me, like what you're talking about. And, you know, if, if there's so many um, uh, examples of sacred feminine stories out there that would give us a new narrative that would help us carve a new path. You know, there are, there are environmental goddesses. There are goddesses about women's leadership, you know, and, and I also tell people, you know what, um, the people who wrote the myths or the Bible stories, um, you know, they had an agenda 
um, and they, um, uh, you know, perhaps they were divinely inspired. So there. So in other words, they are no different than you or I. We have an agenda to to change the world. We want social and cultural transformation so that the world is a kinder place and we all have a better quality of life. And um, you know, so let's start telling stories that help make that happen, you know? And who's to say we aren't being divinely inspired, just like those apostles, just like, you know, the people who wrote those Bible stories, you know? They were no different than us. They were human beings, and they had a message, and we have a message. And I would just encourage listeners to take a Bible story. This is what we do in my writing classes. Take a Bible story and rewrite it uh, you know, take the ugliness out, take the hate out, take the war, the violence, all of that out, and rewrite it. Rewrite it using sacred feminine ideals, you know. Uh, rewrite a myth using sacred feminine ideals. And let that be, you know, the stories that guide us to create the new world. So if we created a goddess religion, would it have the same, would it the same structure, uh, you know, tenets, um, commandments, cu- guidelines to follow, and have maybe the same expectations that some of the, the major religions have uh, as far as their followers? Or would it be more um, just from the nature of, of what it's talking about? Would it be more um, open to interpretation and personal spirituality? I, I think so, uh, because I think the, um, you know, one of the reasons I, I, I talk about the sacred feminine as values rather, or spirituality rather than a religion, um, is because, you know, I think people are tired of authoritarian religion. You know, they want to have freedom, you know, and I think about goddess as sacred feminine liberation theology, you know, um, sets us free to be our authentic self. We don't have these dogmatic rules about, oh, you can't be gay, or you can't be this, or you can't do that. You know, of course, we have to use discernment and good judgment, and we can't kill each other, and we should honor our father and mother. But, you know, we should also... I, I think um, uh, look at the values of the sacred feminine and see how we can bring them into our lives. Um, you know, how do we uh, have respect and partnership and justice and equality? You know, I, I, I laugh a little bit because you know what? If that was the dogma of Abrahamic religions to build. <laughs> have those things, well, then maybe I could swallow the dogma of Abrahamic religions. But unfortunately, you know, the Abrahamic religions are more about um, hierarchy rather than, you know, egalitarian playing fields. It's more about subjugation. It's more about control over and domination. Um, You know, maybe at one point they were well intended, but it, you know, it, uh, power corrupts, you know, and, and it becomes too um, oppressive. And I, I would never want to see goddess spirituality becoming oppressive. I think it's about, you know, being our authentic selves, taking care of one another, love, balance, uh, the sacred feminine and, you know, and, um, and masculine side by side on their throne, you know, in the clouds, if, you know, you want a visual, um, you know, inequality, um, you know, where we have, uh, you know, nurturing and, you know, those are the values that we think are important in the world rather than power over and survival of the fittest and, um, you know, my way or the highway kind of thinking. If I don't know. Does that make sense, Angela? No, it absolutely does. And I actually would prefer it as I was reading through some of um, the essays by the different authors. There was a few people that referred to it as goddess religion and right away that that the r word was making me cringe but when it was you know earth goddess spirituality or earth-based spirituality or sacred feminine that to me seemed more in alignment a more of a resonant match between some of those those qualities and characteristics that we're talking about than that which i perceive you know occurs in in a religious framework 
Yes, yes, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, this is about women to, uh, I mean, there, there are other stories in there about why women need to be in politics, you know, uh, so that we can bring more balance into the world so that these feminine ideas and values start to permeate our, um, you know, our laws and our morality. And, you know, we get away from this dominator model uh, you know, that so many of us, you know, are sort of under the yoke of, um, you know, there's uh, essays in there about, um, you know, the right to health care and uh, women's right to control their own bodies and uh, veganism, you know, uh, because look at look at how we are treating these these um, animals and factory forms. If people could see what really happens to those poor animals, um, you know, I, 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 I think it would cause massive losses probably to the food industry. And that's why they don't let us see those things. Um, you know, so, so there's lots of different topics because we are talking about um, a cultural transformation, you know, a social transformation, a spiritual transformation. You know, we want to get away from domination and power over and, you know, to, um, you know, just a place where, um, you know, it, 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 we can take a breath. And, you know, I, I think of Jesus, quite frankly, you know, um, I, I, I think Jesus was, uh, it was a perfect example of a man uh, who embodied the sacred feminine. Uh, the Dalai Lama, I think, is another one. Uh, former President Jimmy Carter. Um, I mean, there's so many incredible men out there who walk this talk. Bernie Sanders, you know. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's about the ideas and values you have more than it is about our genitals. That's for sure. <laughs> what if you had to describe what um, balanced? You know, if we looked at the sacred masculine, what what would the characteristics of a balanced um, masculinity look like? Well, you know, I think the masculinity or patriarchy or uh, that we see today, it's sort of the shadow side of uh, of masculinity. You know, it's uh, it's masculinity on steroids. Uh, it's an immature. Uh, masculinity. Um, you know, I think uh, I think the balanced masculinity um, is is uh, a wise one. It isn't a uh, it, it isn't one that um, uh, it, 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 they're a protector rather than uh, an aggressor. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, I think of the men who have been damaged by patriarchy, for instance, you know, think of the man who is more your Renaissance man, who may be his interests or writing or the theater or, um, you know, or, uh, you know, things that aren't, say, football or hockey or, uh, you know, and, and think how hard it is for that guy to navigate the world. You know, as soon as he gets into the schoolyard, he's bullied because he doesn't, you know, conform to this version of masculinity. You know, I think the new masculine, he can be anything he wants to be, and there's no consequence for it. He isn't seen as effeminate or, um, you know, or less than because he does doesn't want to take on these dominator roles. You know, I think he's the man who, you know, doesn't think there's anything wrong with being a stay-at-home dad. Um, you know, I think he's the guy who doesn't care if his wife makes more money than him. Uh, he certainly would never be a wife beater. You know, he certainly would never uh, condone raping the earth or, uh, you know, domestic violence or telling a woman what she would uh, you know, do with her body. I mean, it would be someone who is really uh, cares about justice and equality and fairness and uh, not afraid to be gentle and compassionate and, and nurturing. And I think those things are naturally in children and we condition them out you know, uh, the little girls go play with their dolls and they nurture their baby dolls. And the little boys, we put a, you know, we, we put a toy gun in their hand, you know. Um, so I, I, I think these are learned behaviors and they can be unlearned. Um, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it absolutely does. And, and I have actually been quite pleased that lately, uh, you know, going through Facebook, going through Twitter, that 
dialogue about more in touch with their emotions and being able to really look deep within themselves and share those experiences and, and talking about what you were saying that how uh, a person who is more in balance, how they navigate this world of hyper masculinity. And I've been seeing a lot more uh, attention being paid to um, what it looks like for the, the masculine to be in balance. So that gives me a lot of hope. And then at the same time, I've been seeing, like you were talking about at the very beginning, the throws, the pushback, you know, Oklahoma today just basically banned abortion and um, uh, made it a, a felony for anyone who performs an abortion. And then last week there was a basically another ban basing, basically restricting abortions after six weeks. So there's all of these, I, I see the rallying too on, on kind of the, uh, the other side of the equation as well. But I, I do feel that uh, we are in the last throes. Yeah. Well, and, you know, women, uh, women and our like minded brothers are going to have to stand up to this type of domination and oppression. Uh, I mean, it's it's really just as simple as that. And, you know, I think uh, maybe um, I, I, I have a lot of hope uh, in the millennials. You know, I see how they rallied around Bernie Sanders and his message. Uh, I think when they start to see that suddenly their rights are being taken away, um, you know, that they are going to be there at the forefront, along with some of us who have been fighting for these rights and to keep these rights for a really long time. You know, I, I think, um, you know, yesterday um, there were some people on MSNBC who voted for Trump and they said, yeah, they heard all of the ugly stuff he said. And they know that, you know, uh, they don't like a lot of the things that the people in his cabinet believe in, but they don't think those things are going to happen. OK, well, um, I think that when they start to overreach and when they start taking rights like these away from women and if they start saying they're going to mess with Medicare and they start saying they're going to mess with Social Security or they try to go start another war or whatever it is, you know, I think when when people start to really get into citizen mode, you know, because we have been dormant, you know, we've been sitting on our couches, we've been mesmerized by our phones and our video games and being a consumer, when we really start to see that the stuff that people like Trump and his cronies uh, or uh, could potentially do, um, or, or on the brink of doing, you know, I, I think that that is when, uh, you know, we're going to see an awakening like um, we always hoped and, and we imagined, you know, uh, we're going to shut down those switchboards in Congress, you know, we're going to blow up Twitter, you know, um, it, it, I mean, look at what happened with the Egyptian spring. I think we're really going to see that here in the United States is, I mean, there's women's marches scheduled for the day um, after the inauguration already. Millions of women are going to be marching in Washington and probably, uh, I know in cities across the country too. So, you know, this, this, I, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps. This mm -hmm. is the moment we've been waiting for. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm excited. I, I'm determined to be excited and, and not afraid. So the last question I was going to ask you, and perhaps you just answered my question is, is how do we get from here to, you know, the, what you're talking about in Goddess 2.0? And I, I'm guessing you're going to say get involved, <laughs> but is there any, <laughs> is there anything else that helps us usher in this new paradigm uh, in a easier, more efficient, effective manner? Well, I, I would say a few things and, you know, take whatever, whatever works for you. You know, I would say, yes, get involved, uh, find something you're passionate about, because this is going to be a long slog. So uh, if you find something you're passionate about, it will easy, be easier for you to stick with it and be tenacious. I would also say try to find like-minded people for a support group that you can talk to, that you can bat around ideas um, so you have a support system. I would say um, educate yourself. We have to be responsible for our own education because you know what? The corporate media is owned by corporations. Why do you think they shoved Bernie Sanders, they marginalized Bernie Sanders and made him irrelevant? Because the message that he was saying, among other things, was corporations need to start paying their taxes. 
you know, um, and, and, and lots of other stuff. You know, he was talking about things for the people, not for the corporations. So we have to tune out the corporate media. We have to find reliable sources of information. You know, Amy Goodman, uh, you know, Democracy Now! Uh, lots of times the Rolling Stone is a good source. Ring of Fire. Um, you know, there's uh, online people, the, you know, the Young Turks, uh, Jimmy Dore, uh, people where we can get in from, you know, get reliable information about what's going on. Because you know what? I am certain that people who voted for Trump were low information voters. They really didn't know what they were doing. And I hate to say it, but I know for a fact a lot of my women friends didn't really know what Hillary was about either. They just, they just swallowed the the uh, information that came out of her campaign. They didn't really know everything about her and they were dying to have a woman in the White House and, you know, everything else be damned. So it is so important that we try to take some time to know the issues and um, be able to see through uh, the lies that the politicians say, because you know what? I know the Republicans are going to start saying, oh, well, we have to make all of these cuts to Medicare and Social Security to save it. Well, that's bullshit. OK, it's bullshit. Um, and we ha- so we have to know these things uh, so that we know who to vote for and we know what's going on so that, um, you know, we aren't taken advantage of. Well, I love that. And I think that's a great place to end the show. So I want to give you plenty of opportunity to share where people can find all of your books and know a little bit more about you and when your radio show is on, anything you'd like to leave my listeners with today. Oh, thank you, Angela. Well, you know, the easiest place to find me and everything about me is my website. And it's my name, Karen Tate. Dot com, KarenTate.com. And um, you can find my radio show there. I air my show every Wednesday night. It's Voices of the Sacred Feminine on Blog Talk Radio. Uh, there's 10 years of archives there, uh, women and men uh, talking about the big umbrella that is the sacred feminine uh, from the perspective of deity, archetype, and ideal. Um, uh, you know, I can actually sell my books now cheaper than Amazon for some reason. Uh, so please, uh, I, I, you know, I would love for you to buy my books on Amazon, but I would love it even more if you would come to my website, KarenTate.com and, uh, you know, buy books directly from me. Um, so between my, uh, my radio show and, and my books, uh, you know, um, I would, I would just say, uh, check out the website and, um, uh, you know, just just invite you to you know move forward in the world with th- th- seeing the world through through this lens. Are you seeing respect and partnership, or are you seeing domination and exploitation? And I think that's a good measuring stick um, to judge what's happening in the world. Well, Karen, thank you so much for being on the program today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Well, coming up next week, we have Cynthia M. Ruiz, and we are going to be talking about leadership and indigenous wisdom. So that'll be a great follow-up to t- today's conversation. If you'd like to know more about the show, conver- you can go to the theconversationsfromthebrink.com uh, and find out more there. Or if you'd like to know more about myself, Angela Levesque, you can go to angelalevesque.com. You can find me on Facebook and on Twitter at Hestia Health. It's a good goddess name. And uh, yes, thank you for listening. We'll be back next week. Thank you.